Bill Lustig is a writer, editor, producer, and director who grew up with a love of lower-budget exploitation films. He got a start in the industry a way a lot of people did in the 70s, working on adult entertainment films. He got a few jobs outside of the adult industry, such as working as a production assistant in the 1973 film The Seven Ups. While working on The Seven Ups, he met actor Joe Spinell. In the late 70s, he directed a few adult films, but his heart was set on making exploitation and horror films, like the ones he grew up watching. In 1980, he directed the controversial horror thriller Maniac and cast Joe Spinell in the lead. In the mid-80s, he got a call from writer-producer-director Larry Cohen. Cohen, as he often does, invited Lustig to meet him for lunch to talk about movie ideas. Cohen loved Maniac and wondered why he never made a sequel. Cohen told him he had an idea that was born from Maniac. His idea was Maniac Cop, with the tagline, You have the right to remain silent. Forever. The two continue talking, and aside from both movies using the word maniac, they would be completely different. Cohen didn't have a script, just some notes, but Lustig was intrigued and agreed to direct the film. Cohen knew he wanted Bruce Campbell to be in the film as the hero. He called him up and told him, I want you for a movie called Maniac Cop. Don't ask me for a script, because I don't have one yet. He then flew him to New York to shoot some scenes in the St. Patrick's Day Parade. They would somehow work into the movie. They hired a few extras to dress up as cops, and they shot some footage at the parade in New York. They were filming without a permit, and were trying to not get caught. The cops busted some of the extras in the police uniforms, and found the film crew. They tried to tell them this was a student film, but the police saw the professional gear and laughed at them. They made the crew leave, but at least they were able to get the shots they could use later. They also were lucky they didn't get arrested. Much of the footage was real cops and crowds, so this cop probably wasn't happy they had footage of him drinking. Cohen's idea for shooting during the St. Patrick's Day Parade was from one of his own movies, God Told Me To. Andy Kaufman played a killer cop who murdered other cops during the parade. He saw it as the predecessor to Maniac Cop. Cohen started writing the film, and Lustig worked on casting. He was a big fan of Shaft, so he hired Richard Roundtree to play the small part of the police commissioner. Roundtree was also in Cohen's movie Q from 1982. Lorraine Landon worked on a few Cohen films like The Stuff and It's Alive 3. So they hired her to play Teresa. In 1986, Lustig saw a movie called The Night Stalker, starring Robert Zadar. He knew he'd be perfect to play Matt Cordell, the maniac cop. He called him up for a meeting and told him the role was his without the need to audition. Lustig was also a fan of character actor Tom Atkins. He called him up and offered him the part of the cop, Frank McRae. The movie was produced by Shapiro Glickenhaus Entertainment with a budget of about a million dollars. They presented the film as Maniac Cop, and one of the producers said, you're not calling it Maniac Cop, are you? They fought for the title, and the producer allowed it, but put a line in their contract that he could change the title if the film didn't perform. Cohen finished the script, and they were ready to film. It was about a good cop that was seemingly back from the dead and killing just about everyone in New York. Since the movie was low budget, they had to save money where they could. They got wind of a studio that was shutting down, and managed to buy their leftover film stock in cash for the movie. They shot the film mostly in New York, with some scenes shot in L.A., the first victim of the maniac cop was Jill Gatsby, Cohen's daughter. She was upset because he had her killed in every movie he cast her in. She told him she wouldn't do another film with him if she was going to be killed. She went on to do Class of 1999 with Mark L. Lester, who had her killed in the film. The garbage man was Jeff Richard, one of the producers. Lustig's uncle was boxing legend Jake LaMotta, the subject of the Oscar-winning Scorsese film Raging Bull. LaMotta asked him why he never put him in any of his movies. So Lustig had him as one of the officers at the first crime scene. There was a scene early on where they needed an actor to play a medical examiner. When Lustig moved to L.A., his doctor was Barry Brenner, who was none other than Adolf in the film Surf Nazis Must Die. He showed him the scene of the girl getting her neck snapped, and Brenner explained what happened in medical terms. Lustig said, I'll never be able to get an actor to remember those lines, so he hired Brenner for the part. Sam Raimi has a cameo as a reporter. Lustig has a cameo as the hotel clerk. When filming in New York, they knew some places wouldn't let them shoot there if they knew the name of the movie was Maniac Cop. They said they were Cordell Productions and gave the movie a fake name each time. Once again, Cohen upset the Teamsters. They were shooting this in New York as a non-union film. The Teamsters fought back by finding out where they were filming and disrupting the shoots. If they filmed outdoors, they shined lights on the set. If they filmed indoors, they had a motorcycle without a muffler circle the block over and over. To salvage the day's filming, they shot the opening title sequence of Cordell putting on his uniform. Since it wouldn't need audio, it would be covered up by the score. Cohen met with the protesting Teamsters and tried to work something out. Filming continued. For the majority of his screen time, Zadar would have his face covered in scars. 
He told Lustig he wanted to have at least one shot in the movie where it was his real face. So they worked in a shot of Cordell in the newspaper article. For the prison exteriors, they shot by the real prison at Sing Sing. They called the warden, telling them they were going to film. He told them, I don't care what you do, but if you get within 500 feet of the prison, I'm ordering you to be shot down. So they made sure to stay far enough away. The original ending of the film had Cordell falling through part of the dock and being impaled. This was inspired by the movie Best Seller, where this happens to Brian Dennehy, only James Woods rescues him. They even filmed a line of dialogue that foreshadowed it. You got yourself killed back there. Those timbers are ready to break. However, they decided to make the ending much more dynamic. They had the maniac cop being impaled while driving a police van off the pier. Bruce Campbell wanted to do some of his own stunts, and that was indeed him hanging off the side of the truck for some of the shots. This part was absolutely a stunt double, though. Laureen Landon got a little too into her role and almost fell off the roof here. The film was shot in 21 days with two days of pickup shots. Filming ended and they moved into post. While editing the film, Lustig noticed Landon was holding the police badge upside down. It was too late to reshoot, so he left it in. They screened the film for the producers. One of them had a problem. He pointed out how Campbell, the hero, was cheating on his wife. You can't have the hero do that! Cohen prided himself on making layered characters. He often wrote heroes that weren't all good, and villains that weren't all bad. The producer wanted it taken out of the film, but the film hinged on it, so there was no way to do it without massive reshoots. Cohen and Lustig were taken aback by this, because up to this point, the studio had given them complete control to make the film however they saw fit. This producer was one that was hired after filming had begun. It was a good thing, too. Had he had been there from the beginning, they might have had to alter their vision. Forrest was indeed a flawed hero. He's cheating on his wife, which leads to her being murdered by Cordell. Forrest then spends the rest of the film racked with guilt and trying to solve her murder. The movie had a small theatrical run, but was a big hit. It surpassed the studio's expectations, and the producer agreed it was a good idea that they didn't change the name. Audiences loved the tagline. It did so well, Lustig and Cohen immediately worked on ideas for a sequel. The movie was a big hit in Japan. They wanted to play the film on TV, but there was a problem. The film was only 87 minutes, and for Japanese television, you needed it to be 92. The Japanese producers paid them, so they were able to shoot five minutes of additional scenes to put into the film. Maniac Cop generated some controversy, but not nearly as much as Maniac. Maniac Cop 2 was also a hit, so Maniac Cop 3 was greenlit. But that one was plagued with production problems, and ended up being extremely uneven, and not up to the quality of the previous two. I'll talk more in depth about those two in the future. The movie spawned a knockoff, Psycho Cop, which ended up being a hit, so it had a sequel, Psycho Cop Returns. Cohen continued writing and is still working today. Lustig continued directing until 1996's Uncle Sam. He went on to work for Anchor Bay and produced various documentary shorts for them. He eventually left and started the company Blue Underground, which restores and releases cult classics, foreign films, and forgotten exploitation. In 2011, Robert Zadar talked about how much he loved the role and would absolutely do a Maniac Cop 4. Sadly, that'll never happen as Zadar died in 2015 of cardiac arrest. Maniac Cop is a great horror exploitation film. It's a shame in 2001, Campbell called it the worst film he's ever done. Especially sad when you consider by that point, he'd done McHale's Navy and Congo. Lustig's directing was solid, and the movie almost has a film noir look to it. Zadar is a force to be reckoned with, and Campbell, despite his dislike of the film, plays a good, flawed hero. Atkins is great as always, and his death in the film was completely unexpected. Also, Cohen's writing is funny and clever as always mixing the right amount of horror and humor. The movie even includes something that makes every movie better, Buck Flower.